Bonjour. Uh, welcome um, to this talk, which is going to be given by Jonathan Jarman. Just before we, I introduce Jonathan, I'd like to remind you all that there is one last evening talk in the series for this Public Health Summer School, which comes after this one, and that's being given by Mike Joy, and it's called Source Water, the crucial missing water from the new Taumata Arawai Three Waters legislation. And that is um, on Thursday, the 18th of February. So I hope some of you will look forward to coming along to that. And tonight we have Jonathan Jarman here to talk to us about um, risk per perception during a COVID-19 infodemic and our future public health challenges. Uh, Jonathan is a public health physician at, in Taranaki. He's um, the medical officer of health there and has many years of experience of communicating risk to communities and population groups. Um, so welcome, Jonathan, and Katangi Tatiti, Katangi Tikaka, Katangi Hoki Kao, Tahe Maori Ora. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Na mihi nui, kia koto katoa. Kiti atua, tenakoi. Kia papa tuanuku, tenakoi. Kita fari, tenakoi. Kita honga mate, kiti honga ora, tena koto katoa. Welcome to this evening presentation um, hosted by the University of Otago and the talk is going to be on risk perception during a COVID-19 infodemic and our future public health challenges. Tēnā koutou katoa no o tau tāhi a hau, ko Ngāti Pākehā te iwi, here, Medical Officer of Health, O Taranaki, Ko Jonathan Jarman Tokungua, Na Mihi Nui Kia Koto. My name is Jonathan Jarman. I'm a public health physician and I work as Medical Officer of Health in Taranaki. And first of all, I'd just really like to give my thanks and appreciation to the Taranaki District Health Board, who's let me loose on a sabbatical for three months, which is pretty amazing when you consider the public health challenges that are surrounding all of us at the moment. So, um, as Hera mentioned, I have been working as a, um, as a medical officer of health for many years. I've been working in this type of job for nearly 30 years, and risk communication has been, has been a core part of my practice all through this time. And what made me particularly interested was something that happened in 2000. Now, it's in super small print, but it was, this was something that happened in Northland. A anaesthetist had reused syringes between patients. And he'd been doing this over a period of time. And we actually um, counted up the patients where this occurred, and there were 570 people. And at the time, uh, our comms manager, his name was Luke Worth, and our chief medical advisor, his, na his name was Luke Hennevald, we actually worked together, and, and I represented public health, and we actually had a combined approach to risk communication. Because as you would imagine, um, some people might be a little bit frightened if they were one of these 570 people. So the things that we did, we got a hotline going, we had an independent health risk assessment by an infectious disease specialist. We made sure that the patients got the letter first about um, what had happened, and we did a controlled media release. So the actual hazard was determined to be a really low risk, extremely low risk of exposure to bloodborne virus. Now the question is, how would you feel if it was you? 
And so that's really what I'm going to be talking about initially. So there's risk perception, there's going to be the infodemic, and then there's public health challenges. So risk perception. How would you feel if this was you? I went to a course in the United States in 2003 because this, uh, I, I was really fascinated by this whole issue of risk communication. And I came across a, um, a researcher in this area. His name was Peter Sandman. And he actually has this formula and definition of risk perception. And it's R equals H plus O. So R is the perception of risk. The H is the, the actual measurable hazard itself, so the likelihood this is going to happen and the severity. And then there's our human emotional response, the outrage, the fear and the sense of injustice. And there are some things that make um, our outrage higher. So these are things that are, are risky. So if we go through these, there's 12... Peter Sandman has, has 12 principal outrage components, and um, we can apply this to any type of um, public health challenge that has um, issues where there's a hazard. So are people are forced into this, they have no choice, or is it voluntary? Is this something industrial or natural, exotic, familiar, um, dreaded, not dreaded, catastrophic, unknowable? So these sorts of things in the risky column are going to make you feel more anxious and more frightened and give you more outrage. So what we'll do is a bit of, a, a bit of an experiment um, here in the, in the lecture theatre now, and, and for those that are uh, listening by webinar, is let's look at two different types of activities where there is a hazard. So the first one is driving in a car. In Wellington, you're very lucky if you're public transport, you don't actually um, need to use a car a lot of the time. Uh, or you can ride a bicycle if you, uh, it, but there's, that's a separate risk analysis. Um, and then let's look at a topical issue like lead in drinking water. So let's go through um, driving a car. And if you go through, the, these are just some of um, Peter Sandman's um, principal outrage components. And how would you rate driving in a car? Do you, when you drum, jump in the car that came here today or what you did a few days ago, did you consider that you were going to be killed in a horrible car accident? Probably not. So I just sort of filled these in just off the cuff, and I'm not sure if everyone would agree with that. But it, as you can see, that, um, that's at the lower end of outrage. Now, let's have a look at lead in drinking water. Let's say you're in one of these Dunedin communities that's been affected by lead. And, of course, uh, you, if you knew a little bit of public health um, background, you know that lead has been described as the silent thief of children's wits. And, and, and in fact, it goes back a long time, and there's even some thought that the decline of the Roman Empire was related to lead drinking water pipes. I don't know if that's true. But, um, but there's that sort of background to lead. So how would these communities feel? What would their um, risk perception be? And particularly with these types of outrage components. So once again, I've actually filled in these. Um, so, I mean, lead is pretty much an industrial type of um, um, component. It's, I mean, getting lead poisoning would be pretty memorable. People don't know much about lead, so I think they would be quite frightened by this. Um, it's sort of unknowable. Uh, you can't see it. You can't taste it. Nothing to do um, with yourself. It's all to do with the district council that supplies the water supply. And then there are the elements that can escalate our risk perception. So, you know, are there questions of blame? Is there a cover-up? Do you have conflict between different authorities over the level of risk? Were there many people exposed? And, of course, we know that bad news sells newspapers. So all of those sort of compound together, and as humans... 
it affects the way that we perceive risk. So how do you think people in, in um, um, Otago are feeling about lead? They're probably a little bit frightened. Now the next question is where would we put the COVID-19 vaccine if we were going to do this? I haven't answered that one because I don't know. <laughs> Uh, some things that change risk perception is um, something called an availability heuristic. And so this would be a challenge, is that um, tonight, after this lecture, go home and watch Jaws. And then go for a swim in the harbour in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I'll put it out as a, as, a, as a challenge. And of course, it would be quite difficult to do that because in your mind you actually have got this um, vision of this young woman swimming in the dark being eaten by a shark. And so that's, that's sort of availability. It's what comes to mind when you think about swimming in the sea in the dark. There are other types of um, availability heuristics. So people who have watched the movie Vaxxed, may, it may actually um, affect their risk perception, and it may affect their decision about whether they're going to vac vaccinate their children. So we talked about the formula for uh, risk perception. We talked about outrage. And in fact, outrage is the key to risk perception. And in fact, if um, people will accept high, high risks, if um, their outrage is low. So high risk could be smoking. But people, because it's a controllable activity, um, their risk perception is likely to be quite low. But people will not tolerate low risks if, they, if the outrage is high. So if we look at something um, that, that public health authorities or health authorities want, we're pro-vaccination. And these are the sorts of messages that, um, that we are using. And, of course, we want to have low outrage about the vaccine. But people who are anti-vaccination or have anti-vaccination beliefs actually have the opposite paradigm. They want to increase outrage about the vaccine. So they are spreading uh, rumours that it's going to be mandatory, that we're going to be forced into it. Um, that they um, highlight the fact that there were vaccine deaths in overseas countries, such as Norway, um, that it's not effective, and I think maybe that is a concern for many of us about the new variants, um, that it's unnatural, genetic modification, drug companies are going to make a profit, conspiracies, government can't be trusted, and in fact, COVID-19 is all a hoax. So you can see how the, the different, they're using different parts of that sort of um, risk perception um, factors, is that on one hand, one group want to increase outrage, on the other hand, public health authorities want to decrease outrage. So risk perception is, is, is actually something that DHBs um, are very much involved with, public health units are very much involved with. And so if we actually look at these sorts of activities and we look at, um, we, um, look at the x-axis, so that's the hazard, that's the danger, and we look at the y-axis, the outrage and fear and, and, and anger. And um, a lot of what we do in health education is precaution advocacy. This is um, getting apathetic people to take notice. So common themes would, uh, common um, uh, examples would be smoking, getting people to stop smoking. People are pretty apathetic. If you had a public meeting about smoking, probably not many people would turn out. The audience doesn't care. So then we go to um, crisis and emergency um, risk communication, which is a separate part of risk communication, and that's basically the main message is we will get through this together. And we saw this um, when we were going through our lockdown last year. 
Then we have outrage management, which um, is, can be very time consuming. It's what I, a lot of what I do in the public health unit. So if you've got an environmental health issue, and, um, and particularly um, if there are a lot of people really worried, and uh, an example I can think of is we had a, um, a EDA, which is a, um, it's an anaerobic digester. It's part of a, of a surge treatment plant, and Fonterra dumped all their excess um, dairy waste into this and then put a cover over it. Now, you know what happens to custard if you sort of leave it uh, out in the open for a few days. Well, this is what happened under this cover, and it released some particularly noxious gases. The only problem was the cover had little rips in it, and so the gases would leak out at various times, and, and it was highly offensive, and, and there were lots of complaints. But also it was downright dangerous that the cover had ripped. All these very potent gases would come out and poison people. So I went to a public meeting just before Christmas, and... Um, 2013, and the place was packed. There were a lot of people there, and they were angry. So that's a different type of risk communication. It's a big audience, outraged people, and they want to vent. And there are different strategies for actually dealing with, um, with those types of um, risk communications. Now, the other part of risk communication that in public health we don't get involved in so much, but DHBs do, is public relations. And so a lot of the work that DHBs are involved in is uh, in terms of communication is public relations. So the traditional risk communication process, and so health education is an example, is that you have an expert on Western science who uses fear appeal. If you don't get your children vaccinated, they'll get this horrible disease and they'll look like this. So the message goes to the uninformed audience, they change their behavior and you get some public health gain. One problem is that this doesn't work well, particularly in some audiences. So, um, and I'll explain why that happened. So this is an example, for example, of precaution advocacy high hazard, low outrage. So the cigarette packets have got these horrible photographs on them. Uh, you pickle your brain if you drink, um, and then you've got kids with nasty rashes. So that's precaution advocacy. Then you've got the, um, the crisis and emergency uh, risk communication, and we, we know that if, um, in terms of outbreak control, if we get in with good um, rapid public health messages right at the start and tell people what they need to know, what they need to do, do and where they need to go for more information, we can actually change that epidemic curve and we can bring down the numbers of people being infected. And this is, is an, COVID-19 would be an example of this. Then there's um, low hazard, high outrage. Um, this is just a... Um, a um, slide, that, a photo that we did for Facebook. Um, this is related to eels um, with the PFOS in, in Taranaki, you know, the forever chemical. Um, the, we did get a, um, there was a health risk assessment and it was decided that even if you ate the eels, it was a low hazard. But um, there was some people that were very upset by this. So you've got those different types of um, risk um, communication. We talked about risk perception. So what actually um, has made things a lot more complicated is what WHO has called the infodemic. So this is an overabundance of information. So in fact, um, various people have said we have a communication crisis. So we've got a, a pandemic of a, a respiratory illness. We also have a infodemic of information. And I think anyone who was working during the lockdown and, uh, and certainly during most of last year, it, it was not uncommon to have well over 100 emails sitting in your inbox when you got to work each morning. And it was actually quite um, anxiety-provoking because you would know that one or two emails out of that 100 
would be things that you really need to look at. And there might be even one that if you miss, um, it's going to be in the front page of the newspaper tomorrow. So the infodemic, uh, with all this information, and the information, some of it was correct, some of it was ambiguous, and some of it was just plain wrong. But with all this information, it, sort of, it causes people to do fast thinking. So you don't actually get time to sit back and think and reflect. You're on automatic pilot. There's all this information coming to you. And these are some of the new terms. So infodemic was one new term. Another one, which isn't, isn't unique to, um, to COVID-19, but certainly has been uh, more, commonly new, more commonly used um, uh, since Donald Trump. Um, there's disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation. So misinformation is information that is false, but um, it's not creative with the intent of causing harm. Disinformation is information that is false and is deliberately created to cause harm to a person, a social group, organisation or country. And then even further along that continuum is malinformation that is um, that's used to incite harm on a person, organisation or a country. So these are some new terms, so infodemic and those new terms. Um, disinformation is not new. Uh, I was actually just researching this the other day and I found a paper that was written by Nick Wilson, I think 2002 or 2003, and it was, it was on the, the, the uh, strategies that um, I think it was tobacco companies use to, um, to, to get their message out and to try to create doubt about the public health message. So some of these things are actually, we're still seeing in terms of the disinformation that's currently out and about. So it's um, manufacturing false debate and insisting on balance, attacking and intimidating sciences, scientists. So it's interesting, um, I've got a colleague who's in the United States and she works in public health. And um, it, being a public health practitioner in the United States is quite different from being one here. So if you're openly advocating masks, um, you could get death threats. And of course, in the United States, um, people who send you death threats probably got a firearm. I would find that quite anxiety provoking. And attacking legitimate science. And in fact, there's another term, um, FUD, fear, uncertainty and doubt. Um, and you don't have to be right, you just create doubt. And that's, and in fact, um, the, the climate change um, debate is a good example of, of, of this um, disinformation prior to this whole COVID pandemic. And it's said that COVID denial is climate change denial on fast forward. What we're seeing now is just a lot more of it. Another term. Flood the zone. And once again, this is not a new term. Um, this comes from the ex-chief strategist for Donald Trump. And he said this in 2018, the real opposition is the media, and the way to deal with them is to flood the zone with shit. So in other words, it's basically causing an infodemic. And you put so much information out there, you create doubt, you create fear, and you create uncertainty. It's interesting to think that, in fact, um, the use of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, um, was used in Taranaki way back in 1881. So when uh, John Bryce um, uh, invaded Parihaka, he said that it was the headquarters of fanaticism and disaffection. So this was the government message of the time and it was a justification for the invasion of Parihaka. So with this disinformation is that there's been, a, there's evidence that in fact it started to be coordinated. 
And there's some strong political um, drivers for this. So we've seen Donald Trump, we've seen the Brexiteers, um, and this is from the Council of the European Union, and they said that in the EU, EU and elsewhere, coordinated disinformation messaging seeks to frame vulnerable minorities as the cause of the pandemic to fuel distrust in the ability of democratic institutions to deliver effective responses. So this is a communication crisis. This is a major public health threat, as well as being a threat to, to democracy. With my work as a medical officer of health, I regularly deal with people who have strong views about 1080, um, who have beliefs that are anti-vaccination. Fluoridation is going, to, is going to get a bit of an airing in the next few months. Uh, when DHBs are supposed to be um, in charge of um, setting up um, community water fluoridation. But we've seen other examples which I haven't been so involved with, 5G. I have been involved with chemtrails. Chemtrails are, is about some people have belief that there are aeroplanes flying over us and it's sort of geoengineering and it's changing the climate so that there will be some new world order that be able to control us. In fact, that their belief is that climate change is because of, of chemtrails and geoengineering. So you've got these tradi this traditional group of conspiracy theorists. There is another group of quite separate people, quite separate demographic of people who, believe, who are worried about gun control, they're worried about their rights being taken away. Um, they are quite upset about our Prime Minister being a woman. Um, they can have concerns about multiculturalism and they um, often have white um, supremacist views. And then lastly, we have disempowered people. These uh, um, groups of people, particularly indigenous groups of people that have had direct, they have had experience from, for 180 years of um, a government that can't be trusted. So these people actively distrust government messages. What we've seen, this is pre-COVID, what we've seen with COVID is through um, sort of paradigms and, and through um, campaigns from a lot of it from overseas countries, through social media is that these quite separate groups of quite different types of people actually have merged to some extent. And I think the big concern is that they become more coordinated in terms of this disinformation. So this is a photograph from Aotea Square um, from August. Freedoms, rights denied. And this is the sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, information that's going up on Facebook. Sheeple was another term which I didn't know was until very recently. This is people who blindly believe um, what the government is telling them. And this actually is a house that I walk past every day. And um, if you look at it, there's um, reference to QAnon and Trump T-shirts. Um, there is a declaration, a New Zealand Declaration of Independence flag, and a number plate on the car has Q Army, which my daughter tells me is illegal. And finally, if you can't, you can't see the sticker there, but there's a little sticker beside that Q Army number plate, and it says down of 1080. <laughs> so you've seen see these groups that have basically, in this one house, have all come together. So we ha we've got all this sort of going on in the background. And, and I think... We're so lucky in New Zealand, we don't have that sort of polarisation of politics like in the United States. And, and we don't have COVID-19, except um, uh, uh, people arriving in the country and the occasional one that gets loose from um, managed isolation. And, uh, but if we go back and think, OK, what was it that we did that made New Zealand so successful and such a delight to be talking to you and... In fact, um, we don't have COVID that's going to be spreading in this lecture theatre. So first of all, um, we went hard and we went early. 
we had a science-based approach, and that's very much thanks to um, people that work for the University of Otago, such as Michael and Nick. But other, other people like Susie and, um, and other people that were involved with um, have been commenting on, on our response. I have to be honest and say there was some good luck. If we'd, only, if we'd waited one or two weeks, it might have been different. Um, and there's also the 80-20, it's called the 80-20 rule, but in reality it's probably more um, about 90-95, um, 10 or 5. And, that, and what that means is that most of the transmission of COVID is by people who are super spreaders. So only between 5 and 10% of people are responsible for most of the transmission. Political leadership. We are so lucky in New Zealand. I had people in, um, in the UK last year, before, uh, sorry, in 2019, before um, COVID, who came up to me when they realised I was a New Zealander and said, you are so lucky with your Prime Minister. We, we really like your Prime Minister. We wish we had her. So political leadership and, and social capital. I think we're a small enough country that we could actually, there was a cohesiveness and we all worked together. And of course, that, um, that relates to trust. We trust our government. We trust our science advisors. But, so hanging above us is this inequity affects all of us. So that first wave, we didn't see much inequity. In the August um, outbreak, Auckland August outbreak, we started to see inequity. And in fact, if this, if this is something that we don't actively think about and do something about, it could turn to custard in a major way. This is a slide um, from a survey in the UK. It was 4,860 4, UK residents that was taken at the end of last year. And the question was, to what extent, if, all, if at all, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? And the, the one I really want to focus on is that the real truth about coronavirus has been kept from the public. And 27% strongly agree or tend to agree with that. So that shows that, in fact, quite a high proportion of people in the UK uh, uh, don't believe that they are getting the truth about COVID-19. And that's despite um, the number of deaths and the number of cases that they're seeing. I'm not aware of any exact same sort of survey done in New Zealand, but it'd be interesting in New Zealand to see where, what people feel about conspiracy theories here. I actually monitor Facebook and I look at the sort of posts that, are, that go up on Facebook in fact, um, I used to subscribe to New Zealand Herald until I saw what went up on Facebook um, during the August outbreak and the, what they let on their Facebook page that said very unpleasant things about Pacifica people. But I do monitor Facebook to see what people are saying, and it seems that we've got a, quite a large number of very sensible people that live in New Zealand. But there are some people who actively believe in things like conspiracy theories. So this could be a discussion point um, towards the end is, uh, when we finish, is is coordinated disinformation as much a threat to COVID response as people escaping from a managed isolation facility? So that's just a question to think about. So I talked about um, the, the, um, the normal, uh, well, the, the current well, at the, the risk communication process. And what I've done instead, I've put together this gold standard risk communication process. We talk about gold standard contact tracing, so this is gold standard risk communication process. And so it has the same sort of components and elements as, as, the, as the normal risk communication process. So we've got an expert, fair appeal, someone who listens, behaviour change and effect. So I've just changed some of these. So first of all, um, fear appeal has to be used very cautiously. I've had feedback when, when we've done um, measles campaigns in Taranaki that people don't want to be scared unless um, 
they have a significant risk. And in fact, my own sort of feeling is that people wear out. If you, can't, if you keep saying, if you don't do this, you'll die. If you don't do this, you'll die. People just get worn out. Um, but also, if, you, if you're not careful how you use it, people just freak out and say, well, we're all going to die. Who cares? <laughs> so they don't listen to you. So it's just got to be very, used very cautiously. And then, if we look at the community, people in the community are experts on their own community. I can remember in um, Northland many years ago, I was at a, at a public meeting, at a hui, and a kuia stood up and looked at me straight in the eye and she said, Dr Jarman, you may be an expert on public health, but you are not an expert on my community. Wise words. I've remembered it to this day. So then, obviously, it needs to be a two-way partnership process. And we've got to think about the context of, of the audience. And uh, we live in a different um, t an environment as some other people might live. So, for example, we talk about the, the backpack of privilege, the invisible backpack of privilege. So I'm monocultural, I'm, I'm um, Pākehā, I grew up in, in, in Vicargal, um, I was born in Christchurch, grew up in Invercargill, and my father was university educated. I have very little understanding of what it is like to live in, in homes where there is no money or um, um, there is um, no university education um, or they don't have pots and pans, they don't have curtains. I don't, I don't know what it's like. So you need to know your audience. Also, with all this infodemic, there's a lot of noise. So if we're going to do risk communication, how can we um, help people to notice our message when there's all this noise coming in at them? And then there's the, the messenger, the message, and the medium. So these are all sort of um, things that we need to consider with risk communication. And the most important one I've highlighted is the messenger. If um, for some populations, some, some groups, like if you're talking to teenage boys uh, as opposed to talking to people who are retired, obviously, obviously the messenger makes a difference. And in fact, we have lots of different audiences um, and with lots of different contexts is that if we want to do high quality gold standard risk communication, we need to have a, mes a messenger that that audience trusts and can identify with. And that m is probably not at a national level. This is more at a local level. The next thing we need to make sure is that people are able to actually um, change their behaviour. An example would be um, with healthy food. So we say people should eat whole grains, um, they should eat fish at least twice a week, so it's very easy to say that, but what about people who have no money? They have food secure, uh, insecurity, they don't have any pots and pans, they don't have a refrigerator. So how does that work for them? And um, the aim overall is to enable people at risk to take informed decisions to protect themselves and their loved ones. So next we come to misinformation and disinformation. It can derail, can, it can derail the whole risk communication process unless we know about it. And the stronger the gold standard risk com communication process, the less impact that disinformation will have on that community. And lastly, something which I think is so important is trust. Trust requires relationship. Trust requires um, a previous relationship. It's not something that you gain in the middle of a crisis. It's something that you have to do well beforehand. So when we think about this, and you think about the sort of public health challenges we're going to have in the future with, um, with um, COVID vac vaccination, 
and we talk about the equity of vaccination. So how are we going to make sure that our vulnerable communities, who actually um, in many cases are not really vulnerable, they actually have um, immense strengths and resilience, how can we tap into those communities and um, make sure that they are not being impacted by disinformation? So, in summary, I just really want to, to just highlight some of those points that I've been talking about. Um, I've talked about um, that we actually are facing a public health crisis. And in fact, there's really two epidemics. There's an epidemic of respiratory virus and there's an epidemic of, of information. And some of it is, is on purpose incorrect. And um, so we've got these parallel epidemics. And in fact, this 2020 and 2021 are going to be key years, I think, um, for us as a country. And, and, and in fact, the Prime Minister has said 2021 is going to be the year of vaccination. Well, as a, a public health practitioner, I would say that 2022 is going to be the year of outbreaks. Because uh, I'm really concerned that we're not going to get high vaccination coverage in some of our populations. We're going to open our borders. We're going to get cases um, that are going to get through. I don't, know if there will be, I don't know if there will be isolation facilities, but I think we're going to see um, cases of COVID spreading within communities. And, of course, as a result, we're going to see deaths. So gold standard risk communication at a local level is even more important. It's always been important, but I think it's even more important. And it requires public health expertise. This is, this is the old-fashioned public health. It's actually about community engagement and community-led development. It requires a partnership between experts. And I would say that um, not just experts like um, public health um, physicians and um, communication managers. Um, I would bring in extra experts like uh, equity um, experts, equity advisors. Uh, I have an equity advisor in Taranaki, and she just is ever so polite, will say, Jonathan, have you thought about this? And I find that so useful. But also um, clinical psychologists. Um, they are another type of expert. Mainstream public health has not tended to um, be that involved in, in public mental health, but I, I think this, this pandemic has shown that perhaps we should. So there's the, the, those groups of experts, but also they're the experts that live in communities. These are the people that know the community, and we need to have more partnership with them, um, because without that, I, I really do fear for the future. Trust is the key. There's lots of really good reasons why some parts of our community won't trust us or trust the government. And I think we've got to look at those reasons and actually fix them. Identify and address the, the drivers for disinformation. So certain groups of people are more likely to be affected by disinformation. And, and, and in public health, we actually just don't talk about the individual. We actually look at the social determinants of health. So why is this happening? And what can we do to fix it? And finally, outrage is a two-way street. As, as a doctor, when I find uh, someone challenging me on, a, on something they feel very strongly about, a conspiracy theory, I feel very annoyed, and, uh, and I feel quite emotional about it. I want to put them in their place. I want to tell them they're wrong. In fact, um, that's managing my outrage. It's not managing their outrage. I need to step back. Actually, it's something um, that um, I learnt um, about um, child-rearing, but it's, this is nothing to do with children, but it's a very good... Um, way to remember, KFC. KFC, it's not Kentucky Fried Chicken, it's be kind, be firm, be calm. It's 
So that's what I actually apply in my working life. So when I hear these conspiracy theories, I start to feel quite annoyed. Be calm. Be kind. So be kind. So, I mean, people, these people who, who believe in conspiracy theories could be your brother, your sister, could be an aunt, aunt or, or an uncle. These could be members of your family. And so I think we've got to keep thinking that, um, that if we want to get the social cohesion, we need to be kind. And lastly, um, inequities will affect all of us. We can't pretend that this is not an issue. And, and in fact, we need together to develop strategies that will um, protect all of us. And in fact, um, I was listening to a, um, a webinar just the other day um, from a woman who works for the United Nations, and she, she was talking about vaccine equity, but she was looking at it from a national level rather than um, within a country. And she was comparing different countries. And what she said is, no one is safe until we are all safe. And she was talking about the globe. So in fact, inequities will affect us at a global level and in in inequities will affect us at a, at, a, at a national and local level as well. So um, thank you very much for coming and safe journeys everyone and um, thank you to the University of Otago.